All right. Happy Friday, the ominous Friday the 13th uh, on this um, uh, rainy morning here in Montgomery County. But uh, thank you all again for joining us. We are continuing our deliberations over the FY23 budget. And we continue today uh, with the work session uh, regarding the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as several other, uh, other items. Um, so I will uh, Let's see, turn it over to Ms. McGuire and Ms. Yao uh, to make some opening comments. Um, but actually, before I do that, let me just acknowledge once again, I want to thank Dr. Kroll and the entire HHS team, the way that they have been able to step forward during one of our greatest hours of need in the history of our community has been nothing short of extraordinary. And I know it has taken its toll uh, that everybody is exhausted and overwhelmed. I know that we are struggling with recruitment and retention positions within HHS as we are in other county agencies, but we have been so impressed and so appreciative and just deeply and profoundly thankful uh, for the leadership that has been shown. And we have prevented thousands of people from being evicted. We have prevented thousands of people from dying. We have uh, ensured that we created a really strong collaboration and we've developed this really innovative ecosystem of programs and services, including our hubs, which have been nothing short of extraordinary. And so while things have been disorienting and exhausting, I actually am supremely optimistic that many of the underlying issues that contributed to the disparities that we saw prior to the pandemic, there's momentum uh, to address some of the systems issues that created those disparities in the first place. And we've got some really smart and engaged people working on this day and night. And I just wanted to uh, express my deepest appreciation to you, Dr. Kroll, because um, I know this has obviously taken a toll on you as well. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and I do want to uh, acknowledge and thank the county executive for giving us a very, just more than just a good starting point, but um, an acknowledgement that this department in particular um, needed additional levels of support to meet the needs that we are seeing on the ground right now. There will never be enough money to address all of the needs that we see before us. But this puts us in a better position, I believe, than we were before. So with that, Dr. Kroll, I'll turn it over to you to make some opening comments. And then I will turn it over to staff to walk us through the packet. Council President Albernos, thank you. And members of council, good morning. And thank you all for, for, for this uh, opportunity to be before you once again to discuss what I think is going to be a uh, the start of a phenomenal fiscal year uh, for, for, for the department and for the county. Um, and I also want to thank you for the last two years. Whatever type of fatigue and, and, and uh, exhaustion and sense of overwhelmness I've had, um, it has been, uh, we've been boistered by the support the council has given us and the passion that you all have brought to these issues in the last two years. It has been phenomenal working with you all. Um, it has been challenging, it has been tense, it has been intense, um, but we have together come through this in a way that I think puts the county in a better place. Um, I'm, I, I share your optimism about the future. A lot of what we have discovered and learned during this pandemic we will continue to, to, uh, to use as a base for shaping the future and for developing a stronger and healthier uh, Department of Human Services and in turn a stronger and healthier and safer community uh, across the county. So happy to be here and, and looking forward to, to bringing this budget to a conclusion today and hopefully uh, we can actually get about the business of, of uh, actually implementing this budget that's in front of us. So thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, so uh, as you all know, the Department of Health and Human Services budget is a very large one uh, that encompasses a number of different programs and services and divisions. And so it always takes us uh, several days uh, to be able to work through that budget. Uh, this is the first time we're doing this without Linda McMillan in a really long time. Uh, which we were all very anxious about, but I do very much want to thank Ms. McGuire and Ms. Yao, who once again have done an outstanding job in putting the council in the best possible position to work through a very complex and important budget. So with that, I'll turn it over to you to walk us through the packet. <clears throat> thank you very much. So we'll just start with a brief overview description. Uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Albernos, the Department of Health and Human Services um, is certainly one of the larger departments and does uh, consist of several large service areas within it. Um, we'll, we'll, the Department of Health and Human Services for the County Executive's FY23 operating budget is recommended to increase by 57.9 million. That's a 15.9% increase above the FY22 approved level. And most of that, 54.1 million, is in the county general 
general fund, and 3.8 million is in the grant fund. There's also a total increase of 70 FTE recommended, and that's nearly a 4% increase. Each service area of the department does increase in the county executive's recommendation. Uh, that is highlighted for you on page two of your packet. The packet is organized to go through the committee's recommendations by service area, and then also uh, to conclude with uh, going through the joint committee, D, uh, HHS and the Education and Culture Committee also had meetings to review a number of issues that are within DHHS but really extend into the education and MCPS realm. So once we go through the DHHS only service areas, we then will um, also go through the jointly reviewed items that are in DHHS, but again under the jurisdiction of both committees together. Um, I just want to highlight also as, as uh, and reiterate what Mr. Albernos said, that this is really a budget that represents um, the center point that DHHS has been in the COVID response, um, and really that transition from sort of what can and what will be able to be sustained going forward how do we evaluate and monitor the level of need and resources going forward? I think there are a number of areas that you'll hear from today where we're really looking at this as a transitional space to understand how the um, what, what bridges need to be built and understanding that we can't necessarily build all of them today, but that we will continue to look at that to be sure that we match resources and needs as we move forward. So with that, I will jump into the service areas beginning with aging and disability and the committee recommendations start on page four of your packet. Um, I'll just highlight briefly the committee recommendations and obviously if anyone wants to stop and talk about something, please interrupt me in case I'm going too fast. Uh, so again, under aging and disability services, and I'm sorry, I just want to note also that all the HHS committee recommendations were unanimous. The committee supported the executive's recommended level of funding for the Supplement for Developmental Disability Service Providers. For FY23, this is an increase of $1.1 million, bringing the total supplement amount to $20.2 million, and this amount does fully fund the request uh, of our Interact DD service providers uh, that have a close collaboration with the department and with the council. The committee supported the executive's recommended level of funding to supplement adult medical daycare providers. Uh, in FY23, an increase of $1.4 million brings the total supplement amount to $2.1 million. Again, this does fully fund the discussions that those providers also have had with the department uh, and is clearly an important supplement need for both areas. The committee supported the executive's recommendation to add six positions and $954,000 to increase adult protective services. This is an area with um, legally mandated response times as well as increasing workloads. The committee supported the executive's recommendation to add one position and $82,000 to support the long-term ombudsman program. Again, this is an area seeing increased volume and complexity. Supported the executive's recommendation to return the escorted transportation program to pre-COVID funding levels. This adds $43 million. Uh, this was an area that had been reduced uh, during COVID due to reduced use. There was always an expectation that it would be restored and that the restoration is what you see in front of you today. The committee also discussed the Access Hears program, which had been identified by the Commission on Aging. It does support affordable hearing aids and related services for older adults. Um, the department and the committee was very heartened to hear that the department has been working with the, the state uh, Department of Aging to implement this program, and the committee intends to continue to receive uh, updates on the progress of that work. That concludes Aging and Disability Services highlights of the committee's recommendation. Uh, thank you. I'll just note very quickly, I really appreciate the support for Adult Medical Day in particular, which I know is, um, as we've all been on the record stating, uh, presents a unique opportunity, particularly with our aging population, to identify more support for our aging community. And I know our nonprofit organizations are incredibly supportive and, and appreciative that we've been able to expand and continue to support them to make them whole. Um, as they address recruitment and retention issues too. Don't see, oh, Council Member Rice. Just, just very quickly, and I'd be remiss, um, I was just at Gallaudet University last night. Um, the Access Heroes program is something that is incredibly important. Montgomery County is home to one of the largest deaf and hard of hearing populations uh, in this region. And so uh, it really is important for us, especially for our aging adults, uh, to be able to have access to affordable hearing aids, uh, something which isn't talked about a lot, uh, but certainly is incredibly important as we talk about inclusivity, when we talk about language access, 
uh, the fact that you can't hear and understand what a person is saying is just as bad as not being able to have the language. And so this is incredibly important when it comes to uh, the psyche of so many uh, to be still included in their daily lives and be able to remain attached to communities. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. The next service area is behavioral health and crisis services. The majority of adjustments in this program area took place in multi-program adjustments, but there are a couple significant um, recommendations that uh, the committee noted. The first one is supporting the executive's recommendation. Uh, there are two adjustments to the county's contract with Every Mind to operate the Montgomery County hotline. The first adjustment is 795,000, which would support services at an enhanced level that was put in place during the pandemic uh, through special appropriation. The second adjustment is $1 million, and that's to support the transition of the hotline from to the 988 National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Uh, this is anticipated to substantially increase the level of calls and texts coming to the hotline. The committee wanted to come back to a joint committee meeting uh, with HHS and ENC to monitor the transition of 988 to ensure that the call volume is, uh, that support is available if needed to, for the services. And they also wanted to hear from MCPS about need at that point in time. Um, the second item that the committee supported as far as the executive's recommendations was adding one position, $116,542 to be funded by the City of Rockville to provide mental health support to the Rockville Police. This would fund the support the crisis intervention team approach in the City of Rockville. It's cost neutral. It would divert individuals with mental, health, mental illness out of the criminal justice system and into treatment. And those are the two uh, items uh, of note. Thank you. And I should have done this up front, but uh, just a quick housekeeping. Councilmember Friedson will not be joining us today. He's attending a very important family function. Uh, and Councilmember Jawando is, I believe, joining us virtually uh, right now. So um, thank you. Uh, and I don't see any questions or comments from colleagues. So I guess without objection. OK. The next service area is Children, Youth, and Family Services. Most of, the oh. Most of the programs in this service area were re reviewed by the joint HHS and ENC committee. But there are a few, again, programs of note here. Uh, there are a number of adjustments that the executive recommended and the, and the committee supported in terms of child welfare services. One, the first one is to add a program manager for $107,243 to provide oversight and management of audit-related requirements in child welfare services. The second is supporting the executive's recommendation to add $73,125 for legally mandated translation services. Um, next is adding $70,440 for a principal administrative aid to support the background check screening processes for community-based agencies and school staff. And the last one for child welfare services is adding $60,360 in the county attorney's office to support um, secretarial work to handle guardianship issues. Um, the last item that the, the committee reviewed was supporting the executive's recommendation to add $260,933 to continue the East County Opportunity Zone services after the grant. Um, we, the, the county had received a Kresge grant, and that grant is expiring. Uh, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. A question regarding the East County Opportunity Zone. Um, I recall that we you know, had conversations in the past about the lessons learned regarding this approach and how it would very much benefit uh, transferring those exact lessons or that template to other areas of the county that have similar challenges, uh, whether it be in the mid-county area or up-county, Germantown area, et cetera. Um, are we planning on doing anything like that? Um, it kind of goes to that notion of trying to make sure that we capture whatever has worked, learn from it, and then scale it if necessary versus just kind of keeping it in, in one specific spot. So th thank you, Councilmember Navarro. Uh, the, um, the 
as the grant winds down, there is a final report and outcomes data that's being that's being drafted. Now it's off cycle for our budget for our budget session, uh, but it is it's in process of being of being um, completed at this point as the grant wraps up. The the thing I would say is that we have learned lessons all along from this from this grant, mm -hmm. and one of the things that has become abundantly clear is that the coaches model, the coaching model that they put together at East County, has been really useful for. For families, and that has been probably the number one thing that the community has said to us is that it is invaluable. It's an invaluable resource, and some of that I think is going to find its way into other parts of our work, the navigation efforts that we're trying to stand up, our call center efforts, our customer support efforts. Hopefully, we'll learn from that. My intention is that we will learn from that and we'll expand that. And I also think that uh, the guaranteed income pilot that we're working on will benefit from some of that knowledge as well. Got it. Yeah, I, w I, I would really, you know, just want to encourage us to. To, to maintain that kind of philosophy. I think it's um, just a, a really awesome way. It's also cost effective because then we know specifically where we need to invest. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that we have stand up, you know, stood up the, um, the hub, the hubs around the, the county, and then I know we're strengthening the regional services centers. It just, I think it really complements that effort nicely. I was just gonna add that, that the hubs have also learned from some of that as well. Yeah. We made sure that they're aware of the kinds of work yeah. that are going on, that's going on in the, e in the ECOS and hopefully Great. Um, those those lessons are being picked up and will be adopted in, to, in the hubs as well. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, the next service area uh, is public health services and that begins on page six of your packet. Um, the committee reviewed uh, a, a number of requests related to health care for the uninsured and that is a little bit of an umbrella title that we use for um, a number of key programs including health care for the homeless, Montgomery Cares, Care for Kids, uh, the Maternity Partnership Program and Dental Services. The council does receive additional um, uh, advice and recommendations on this area, this cluster of services from what is uh, casually known as the Troika leadership. Uh, that includes the Montgomery Cares Advisory Board, the Primary Cares Coalition, and the Health Centers Leadership Council, which of course are the key uh, leadership stakeholders in the Montgomery Cares and again the Healthcare for the Uninsured Network that the council and the county uh, uh, has in place. Um, so just wanted to represent that again that discussion did uh, reflect the recommendations from all the sources as well as the recommendations uh, from the Commission on Health as well. The committee did acknowledge uh, that a great deal is in flux at this time around the reimbursement rates, particularly for, community, for Montgomery Cares and the Care for Kids programs. Um, the committee requested that the department return prior to the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year, potentially by September 15th, to, res to report on uh, the utilization rates, how those are changing, uh, uh, again, as we uh, come out somewhat of the COVID pandemic experience, how the health clinics are experiencing those in the, in the range of these programs, and then be able to understand how that utilization impacts a possible timeline to transition from block payments to fee-for-service potentially at some point during the coming year. Uh, there also has been um, discussion around the work and timeline to restructure the reimbursement rates uh, to align with regional administrative standards and regional competitive competitiveness for uh, these kinds of healthcare rates. Again, what we see here is a significant amount of work, uh, planning work to do um, on behalf of the department and of course the, um, the partners in this area. Um, and so pending the systemic work, the committee recommends deferring any rate increases specifically in these programs at this time. On a related note then, because of holding those rates uh, in advance currently while this work is pending, the committee did recommend adding funds on the reconciliation list to apply the inflationary adjustment for nonprofit providers to the Montgomery Cares Health Clinics. This is typically not uh, part of the inflationary adjustment, again, because those rates are typically set separately each year. However, again, in light of the previous recommendation, uh, it was the committee's intent to ensure that those clinic providers did have an ability to have an inflationary cost adjustment. So the reconciliation list does reflect funds uh, for whatever action the council ultimately takes on the inflationary adjustment to apply to these providers. Uh, just one more caveat to add there, this is intended to be temporary, one time only, and not have any future implications for uh, application of rates or anything else to this group, which will again, will come back to the systemic work. The committee uh, did recommend adding $76,000 on the reconciliation list for an Sorry about that, uh, Councilman oh, Navarro. Um, yeah, just a, um, a quick observation because I, you know, maybe obviously after budget, um, I know that in the throes of the pandemic when we were 
standing up the Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar, the African American Health Program initiative. There were a lot of conversations about like, okay, so how can we take advantage of these structures going forward? Because obviously we know so many people are now um, pretty much, you know, trusting this these initiatives, right? So as we move away from pandemic, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity that we have because then we can encourage and also provide access to other kinds of health services, et cetera, through that trusted relationship. Are, is, there, is there a connection between, um, is there a bridge in some ways between those initiatives and things like the Primary Care Coalition, you know, um, Montgomery Cares, et cetera, so that it can begin to be embedded and that way, anytime that we feel the need, of course, to, you know, provide any kind of uh, public health message or encourage people as we're tracking data, et cetera, they're part of that system. So the short answer to that is yes, um, some of the providers who are actively in, uh, in the Waste Water Salute, EVN Star, are actually part of the Montgomery Cares Consortium as well. So there's a natural bridge between those two, between providers. And I think as we go forward and begin to understand where those two program, those two discrete efforts have overlap, have overlaps, we'll begin to be able to put them together. One of the things I believe has happened and should happen is that where there are folks who are uninsured or underinsured, that there should be an automatic referral and connection process between those groups. So we'll be working with, with PCC and, and, and the, uh, the advisory boards to, to try to make sure that's a strong connection. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. The committee did uh, recommend adding $76,000 on the reconciliation list for an administrative position for Care for Kids program and $121,000 for a senior planning specialist in the department. These d directly support um, increases in both of these areas. Again, there are significant increased utilization uh, pressures in care for kids and the additional position is necessary there to support that increased work. Um, and as we've been discussing, there certainly is a wide range of planning uh, and structural systemic review to um, be accomplished this year in public health. Uh, and so that planning, ses planning specialist position would support that work. And again, that was recommended both by Troika and by the Commission on Health. The committee added $114,000 on the reconciliation list to the Maternity Partnership to initiate a breastfeeding support initiative. The committee added $160,000 on the reconciliation for, list for dental services. $60,000 of this is for a consultant to facilitate a design process for the dental safety net support network of public and private providers, and $100,000 is to uh, support specialty services. The committee also supported the executive's recommendation to add one position and $85,000 to the tuberculosis program uh, and noted that unfortunately Montgomery County does fluctuate in having the highest or nearly the highest uh, TB rate in the state. So again, this additional position uh, is necessary to work to support that effort. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you so much. Um, can you summarize for me, please? What does the executive's budget recommend as far as those three you know, as far as our nonprofit health providers, our partners, I'm a little confused. It, is it level funding essentially? So, uh, for the nonprofit providers, you know, are you? Well, the, the, the collection of requests that um, you're going through right now, yeah. you're talking about some of the additions on the reconciliation list that the committee has added. What is in the executive's core budget? So. And I just want to be clear which programs you're asking about because there are some other programs in other areas. The Montgomery Cares, Care for Kids, um, and dental services were recommended uh, for level funding in the executive's budget. Uh, level funding with, of course, sort of natural programmatic increases, but not... Not on a new service Not expansion. a new services uh, budget. Thus, the reconciliation list requests would add um, as represented here. Um, again, the, the, rep the committee's um, represent committee's additions to the list represent an inflationary increase for the providers in Montgomery Cares. Um, again, because of really wanting to do deeper work on the rate structures for Montgomery Cares and for Care for Kids. And then, and, and in fact, across others as well. Um, then there are requests on the, rent, on the reconciliation list for maternity partnership and dental program. All of that would be above the executives recommended closer so to level service budget level. So it's the same, let me same services might be a better word for me. Yes, thank you. Uh, so same, it's the same services budget essentially for the major part of the, the Montgomery Cares Advised yes. Health Programs. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. 
That was a better summary than I did. Thank you. <laughs> I knew there was a neutral way to describe it. I was looking for it. That was Thank you. <laughs> that concludes public health services. Moving on to services to end and prevent homelessness. Um, the committee had a number of significant discussions in this area as well, and one of them related to uh, emergency shelter services. The committee did support the executive's FY23 funding level for the emergency shelter services system. This does include funding to operate the emergency shelters year round for the first full fiscal year. The budget also adds 700,000 to implement uh, a 24 seven shelter hotline and to implement a centralized intake and support model for single adults that also has been replicated uh, elsewhere in the department and was initiated through a pilot. This would again uh, really expand that um, effort. The committee also discussed here requests from nonprofit providers for additional funding support um, and understanding that there are uh, definitely cost pressures, operational experience dynamics and other um, issues at play. The committee did request that the department work with providers to evaluate these cost dynamics in the context of their operational experience as the upcoming fiscal year uh, begins and unfolds. Um, the, the committee requested that, again, the providers and the department work together to really set expectations for services, for levels of cost. And, and this does just relate to, again, understanding that this is a new phase of our operations with emergency shelters, as well as, again, the continuing pressures that we um, have been referring to around where we are in this experience and transition. Um, so as a result, um, again, the committee did want to ask for a systemic recommendation and, the, and may want to set a uh, date certain to come back for that discussion in the fall uh, to schedule follow-up on this issue. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to our lead for uh, homeless and vulnerable populations, Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning. Uh, you know, this is uh, another example of the incredible work that we've done and continue to do and county government uh, over a very, very long time, everybody involved. And uh, as Council President noted at the beginning of today's budgetary conversation, uh, you know, we've been doing uh, incredible work to keep people safe, healthy, and housed. And uh, these are, uh, th this budgetary item, this package is uh, the manifestation of that uh, for our most vulnerable residents. And appreciate everything county county government has done, our staff, uh, and of course our partners, our community partners, uh, our social safety net partners, uh, and, and their staff, employees, and board members. And with regard to um, the inflationary pressures that you use, you know, I, I think that, that clearly is the right term, uh, and that is something that could be applied and is being applied across the entire budget. But with regard to not only the inflationary pressures, but the job pressures, right? The number of individuals that are experiencing homelessness um, and the societal pressures that are, that we are tasking our nonprofit partners with doing, um, or the help that we're requiring them to do, to provide. I just wanna get a better understanding of, from your perspective, what those pressures are. Right at the council uh, at the committee level, we said that we were going to have a conversation in the fall. I just wanted to get a better understanding uh, f right now of what those pressures might be. What what is being asked of our nonprofit partners, and the delay in our action. Right, what does that mean for them and for the support that we're expecting them to provide? I think I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Harris to join me, join us at the table to talk a little bit about that in some detail, but while she's on her way, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to simply say that I think there are a couple of things. One is that uh, the, the dynamics of our homeless population have changed and are continuing to change, both in terms of the level of health and mental health issues that they present to us and the need to change how we operate in the shelters and across the entire continuum of, of uh, of our, our homeless continuum from diversion to rapid rehousing and, and supported housing on the other back end of that. The, the, other, the other change, both in terms of how we deal with the pandemic, um, how, we do, how we deal with COVID and, and health and safety going forward um, is one issue. The staffing issues are another uh, as well. Uh, I think we have um, learned a lot of lessons over the pandemic um, that, have, that have helped us to, to protect our, our, both our staff and the populations. And of course, rising costs in, in, uh, of, of operations are, are a piece of that. Um, our sense of this now is that we need to understand more fully 
what is going, what is happening uh, in, in the shelters with our partners. And as part of our Recovery 2.0 initiative, we will be including some work around homelessness and housing um, as part of that to make sure that we are planning for the future and building on what, it, what we put in place already. So sure. with that, I'll stop and turn it over to Ms. Harris. Thank you, Dr. Kroll. And good morning, everyone. Amanda Harris, Chief of Services to End and Prevent Homelessness. Uh, I think you summarized it quite well. Uh, I would just add that even at the height of the pandemic, uh, our homeless continuum never stopped working. And we continued to provide face-to-face -face services uh, when many of our other partners were, were not and had completely shifted to, to telehealth. Um, where uh, just we're not we're not accepting uh, new referrals, and so that that does that had a ripple effect on the homeless continuum. Not only were they staying open and continuing to receive people, but they are also seeing folks uh, with more significant mental health and substance use challenges, uh, which also makes sense because it was in the middle of a pandemic and everyone was very stressed out. Uh, so that that just added another layer. Uh, we are continuing to partner with them to figure out different strategies to address the, the recruitment and retention. Uh, of course, increased salaries would be great, but that's not it. That's not the only thing. Uh, we have been definitely interested in including more people with lived experience on the staff. Uh, I think they provide, uh, they have a, a better way of being able to connect with people and uh, tend to be very committed to doing this work and wanting to give back. So that's one strategy. Uh, and just also looking at some other creative ways to uh, to retain the staff that we do have and creating leadership opportunities. Uh, we This is our third year in a row that we have a leadership development program called Lead for Impact that is open to emerging leaders in the in the COC. So again, that creates movement for them. I, I appreciate that from both of you. And you know, as we've been discussing, particularly this week, the budget within the full council, we've we've talked about the supply and demand constraints regarding nurses and social workers and police officers and teachers. And so here we're talking about frontline personnel. And where it gets even trickier is they are through our social service agencies, our nonprofits, and so they are not directly county employees. And I think that creates a wrinkle in the relationship and particularly with the funding. And it's something that we have to be mindful of to understand the pressures that our providers are under uh, because it is not as a simple line item as it would be with other departments or agencies within county government. And so I know that we have a placeholder to revisit this. Uh, and I just want to make sure that there is no gap either in service uh, or additional constraints that might be put upon them in between that time we revisit this conversation. And I just wanted to point that out. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I'll just note, uh, this didn't come up in committee, but um, I'm just going to say it now. We need to also, it, it is the right thing to do to make sure that we annualize these services. Um, absolutely. Uh, but we also have to recognize and own that that will bring other responsibilities by other corresponding agencies and department who will need to support the Department of Health and Human Services and the support of the organizations doing this work directly. So we do need to look at this holistically. Um, and so we, we will need to follow up um, and see what other programs and services will be needed, what other supports will be needed to make sure that we are in, an, in through the entire community providing the wraparound services that this constituency needs. Mm -hmm. Just to note that, so I would agree with you on that. And, and one of the things that we're doing now is, again, as part of our Recovery 2.0 and thinking about strategic planning for the department is to look not just within CEF, but across the programs to see what other services need to be brought to, to the table to, to make sure that, that the homeless continuum, the, the folks who come to our shelters are run the age range from children to, to older adults. And so we need to make sure that the rest of the department is equipped to handle and support uh, CEF as they bring folks into the shelters and, and help them to get back to, uh, to, to uh, independent housing or independent living. Great. So uh, next we have a related item uh, to the previous discussion in that the committee supported the executive's recommendation to add $600,000 to the Health Care for the Homeless program to increase psychiatric services in the emergency shelter system. And again, that does represent, as you were saying, the annualization of the um, shelter, shelter system services uh, and therefore the increased demand for these services as well. 
Could you just room. explain a little bit more? Is that uh, therapists in the facilities? Or? And I may ask Dr. Kroll or Ms. Harris to answer that. Sure. So what that covers, and we actually have already been providing these services. We uh, had one-time funding from the State Department of Housing and Community Development. So uh, because we have more shelter beds, we have 400 year-round shelter beds, we needed to increase the services, right? So uh, that includes primary care that is provided in the shelter by a, a physician and then some nurses. Uh, it also includes we have a new partnership with a community psychiatrist. Uh, so it's psychiatrist hours, uh, a psych RN, uh, and then also that includes a peer support. Moving on to the rental assistance program, uh, the committee did support the executive's recommended funding level for rental assistance. The FY23 recommended total is $8 million in total. $4 million of that is new county funding. The new county funding both replaces $1 million of ARPA funding that had been previously used and adds $3 million to increase the overall funding level and capacity of the program. The balance of that does uh, come, and reside, come from and reside in the HIF, uh, and that equals the $8 million total uh, for that program. The Council did also allocate $3.43 million of FY22 ARPA funding to continue to support the program as those state and federal dollars are ending. And so again, as we know, this is an area where there are multiple funding streams coming together to support this program. Uh, there is a recommendation for increased county funding to um, maintain a high level, as high a level as possible under the circumstances. The committee supported the executive's recommended funding increase of $2.5 million for the rapid rehousing program. Again, this recommended FY23 increase both replaces ARPA funding in the amount of just under $500,000 and adds $2 million of new county funds to expand the program. Councilmember Rumor. Could you just give us a little more information on this? And while you're describing, um, the pilot that you executed around providing a financial uh, you know, financial support. Um, how is that? How is that gone? I'm sorry. If you could just repeat the last part. Uh, uh, well, yeah. first, the <laughs> update on the rapid rehousing. Just uh, please, it's a big new investment. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's very important. Just give us a little bit of depth here. But um, the program that you initiated to provide a you know, I think it was like 10,000 basic Is that, basic yeah, yeah, the five, no, that's no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking yeah. about the homeless. Uh, yeah. It was just for yeah. individuals experiencing homelessness, right. and it was to help them get back yeah. on their feet. Yeah. And it was a pilot program. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was ARPA funded, I think. Uh, it doesn't CRF. matter. Um, and it was getting great results in its initial, so if you could just share with us. Sure, I can absolutely talk about that. So the rapid rehousing, again, we had a huge influx of federal resources, so we got a HUD money emergency solution grant to expand our rapid rehousing. It's working really well, so we'd like to be able to continue that. Uh, so that's uh, what that funding is for. Um, rapid rehousing is what we're, let me back up. What we're seeing in the continuum uh, is more and more people are experiencing homelessness for the first time, and they are coming with you know, previous employment. Maybe they just they got sick and they, you know, lost their job, or it, it, it looks a little different than it used to. Uh, prior to our major initiative where we work to end chronic homelessness, we're seeing more people with really significant uh, behavioral health and substance use and medical needs, and so now. The population absolutely still needs supports, but not uh, not forever supports. So that's the, the so that's point. that's interesting, right? Because it might mm -hmm. mean that we can help them in that in that moment, and they're they're fundamentally independent. Uh, right. It's just that they've fallen in a in a in a hole, and we can help them out. Yep. And the faster we do that, uh, the more likely right. they are to well, succeed. Well, that's right. That's a good point. Right. So the exit bonus program, you're correct. It was a five thousand dollars direct cash assistance for people entering homelessness for the first time and um, ready to exit shelter. Uh, it still is pretty successful. We're, we have continued that. Uh, our success rate is about 80%. Uh, we'd like to get it higher, but 80 is... 80% leaving homelessness. Yes, and staying housed. And staying housed. Yes, and staying housed. That's great. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. is... It's if it's an apples to nap apples, that's a lot less expensive than providing, uh, you know, housing. Correct. Yes. And services. Yes. And it also 
uh, allows people to have more autonomy and to, right. to make decisions that are going to work best for them. Right. Uh, we've had people use that money to fix their car so that they could right. do Lyft and Uber. We've had people buy tools because they wanted to get back into uh, mm -hmm. like being a craft worker. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we hope to continue. Uh, that was funded through CRF. Right now we have been using some of, uh, I think it's been HIF money that we've been using to continue that. And, and we hope to we hope to do more of it. Thanks. The committee supported the executive's recommendation to add 105,000 in one position to address a federal requirement for coordinated system entry. This is a HUD requirement that is not uh, funded, but it does work to ensure a coordinated entry system to ensure fair and equal access to resources. The committee supported the executive's recommendation of $180,000 to the Pathways contract to increase multilingual capacity in the outreach services in Silver Spring and Wheaton. The committee supported the executive's recommended match of $1.7 million for HUD community providers. This is the continuum of care match. And the committee did support the executive's recommended increase of $21,000 for medical respite services. This brings the total to $571,000 for FY23, and it does reflect uh, increased costs that are just being experienced. The department does uh, report success with the initial efforts in this area and continuing to work with uh, hospitals. That concludes. Council member. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, uh, Dr. Kroll or Ms. Harris. Could, can you just, it's been a little while since we talked about the Pathways contract. It took a long time to get that in place. Um, we were optimistic about it at the beginning. Can you, I haven't heard an update in a little while. Would you mind sharing how that's going? It's going great. I haven't heard any complaints, so that makes me feel any, optimistic. About anything it. more you can tell us about uh, <laughs> the number of people served or? I, I, I don't have those okay. numbers off the top of my head, but I can certainly get those for you That'd be and great. provide them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. I'm glad it's in place. Thank you. So there are a number of uh, issues that are embedded within the administration and support uh, service area of the department, so we'll move through those issue by issue. The first issue is the inflationary adjustment to eligible nonprofit contracts. This has been referred to a little bit in our prior discussion, but the committee did a couple of things here, and one was to support the county executive's recommended FY23 operating budget addition of a total of $4.2 million to provide a 6% inflationary increase to eligible contracts. This represents the amount uh, specific to DHHS. The executive's budget does reflect a larger amount in total across departments to uh, reflect, again, that 6% increase because there are eligible, eligible nonprofits in other departments. The committee did have extensive discussion around the importance of supporting the nonprofit provider network. Um, and as a result, the committee also rec recommended adding two tranches to the reconciliation list that would represent an additional 2% each that would bring the possible total adjustment to either 8 or 10% for eligible contracts. For DHHS contracts, this amount requires two tranches of nearly $1.4 million each on the reconciliation list. Again, uh, as we just referenced, the committee did discuss that certainly there are eligible contracts in multiple departments um, and expressed the committee's interest uh, in a uniform approach. Thank you. Um, I'll note uh, that there does need to be an adjustment uh, that's made, so let me tee that up now. Um, we've all, again, been on the record extensively expressing our appreciation and support for nonprofit organizations, which are key partners in being able to carry out our program service delivery model and ensure we have the tightest possible safety net that we can. And we've also all acknowledged that uh, they have been tested in ways that we've never anticipated before, and that has created some cost burdens, uh, some of which we talked about in the homeless context just a little while ago. And we appreciate the county executive's acknowledgement and uh, putting forward the 6%. Um, we felt that if possible, uh, in examining through the reconciliation list in an attempt to lift all boats, because we have individual nonprofit organizations that understandably have reached out to each of our respective offices asking for additional support uh, to be able to carry out their programs and meet the needs in the community. And there was a feeling by the committee that, as we have done in the past, um, that if there's a way that we can lift all boats, that that would be a preferred method. Uh, than individually providing support here and there as part of uh, the budget process. 
Um, there may there are certain circumstances that obviously warrant additions to various community-based organizations, but holistically across the board. Um, when we voted on this just a week ago, we did not fully take into account the uh, accelerated um, costs with regards to inflationary adjustments. And so the true cost, if we are going to include the 2% and the 2%, uh, is an additional $673,984. And so to stay consistent with that inflationary adjustment, we would need to add uh, to each of the two tranches $336,992 uh, for uh, consideration as part of uh, the reconciliation list. I want to make sure I got that right, Ms. McGuire. Uh, yes, I just want to confirm one thing, which is that, again, as you're saying, that does um, what that does is ensure that it would be uniformly applied across all eligible nonprofit contracts in all departments. So for example, there are um, there are another area where, where people are generally familiar with these contracts is in recreation, for example. Some of them are HCA, but there are also, uh, again, just eligible nonprofits in many departments. And to ensure that the funding would be there um, to meet the count, if the council's intent is that it be applied uniformly, these funds would need to be added to uh, achieve that goal. So, colleagues, I request that so moved by Councilmember Rice, uh, seconded by Councilmember Hucker. I don't see any discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Aye. All those present and virtual. Thank you. The next issue area um, that the committee discussed are the service consolidation hubs. Um, and certainly, as was raised earlier, the committee discussed the um, critical importance of these hubs in the county's provider network and really the significance of the achievement uh, that the hubs uh, have, have demonstrated in implementing a new uh, and an exemplary model of a community-based service approach. The committee did identify that, again, this is another area that really does reflect this transition that we're in of understanding ongoing needs and sustainability and will need to be uh, monitored as we go forward to understand how that experience impacts the need. The committee did support the executive's recommended FY23 funding level. This increases the total funding by $2 million from $3.6 million to $5.6 million. That's the total funding, again, of, of the hub allocations. The FY23 recommended funding level consists of $2.6 million in new county funding and $3 million in ARPA funds. The council had previously designated that there would need to be ARPA funds to continue this effort, to continue to support it in FY23. Um, but again, there are also new county funds to build on that. The committee did also discuss um, the rec executive's recommended approach to really strengthen this model and continue to build capacity, again, in a continuing effort to move from emergency response into ongoing and community-based systemic approach. Um, it does include a tiered funding approach according to the level of service and geographic coverage, and it does increase significantly case management. Um, it does not, this allocation, I want to be clear, does not include the food allocations. Uh, that is uh, budgeted separately, and the idea is again to continue to build one model and add food as, a, um, as an element of that. Wanted to emphasize as well that the committee did discuss and support uh, the council's approach to maintain hub funding for the Oak Chapel site through allocating ARPA funding. At the um, April 19th update, I'm sorry, this is an incorrect date here, but at the April 19th update at the council, Councilmember Navarro suggested that we look at the possibility of using ARPA funds to restore funding for the Oak Chapel site. Uh, and the full council did concur with that recommendation, and of course the committee did as well. So a total of 300,000 in ARPA funds will be allocated uh, to continue the hub, fun hub functions at the L Oak Chapel site. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Just really quickly on the hubs. Um, I mean, we can never say it enough, just expressing our deepest appreciation to all of them, um, in particular in Germantown, which helped spawn this movement, uh, which has been nothing short of extraordinary. And I know that many of them have met with us acknowledging that the need not only has not dissipated, but it has increased. And our firm commitment, as it has been all along and will continue to be, is, is that we will revisit this in real time, make adjustments as necessary to ensure that the support is not just maintained, but in certain areas enhanced. The challenge, of course, is we did use a great deal of federal funding in the midst of the chaos of the pandemic um, that has an expiration date. Um, but I want to once again reassure the incredible individuals that are staffing and have started these wonderful 
projects and initiatives that we remain committed to supporting them. And we will be revisiting this again uh, either in the late summer or early fall uh, to once again assess and evaluate what more we can do. Dr. Councilmember Rice. Just, just very quickly, and I appreciate that, and it uh, dovetails into the next discussion, but it is one in which we're seeing uh, based on what, what uh, unfortunately is happening with uh, formula as to just how fragile uh, our supply chain is when it comes in, you know, let's, let's be real. We've seen it with um, our hubs that are distributing diapers as well as formula and other kinds of things to our constituents who need it most. And the fact is, is that now even those who can afford it can't find it. And that just shows how close we are in teetering to that level of vulnerability that exists, not just for those who don't have the means, but for everybody across the board. It is really a reason why we need to continue these efforts and really wanna thank the Department of Health and Human Services who's been at the forefront of making sure that we understand that this is not some need that's going away. In fact, it's going to continue to grow as we continue to see instability that happens across the world, especially when it comes to food availability. So thank you for that. Uh, Councilmember Navarro. Yeah, that's a great observation. Um, I uh, also, you know, I know all of us are actively engaged, uh, some more than others, in conversations out there in the community. Uh, it is election season, but it is interesting. I mean, it's not as if we don't hear this all the time, but now in particular, of course, there's just a lot of um, interaction and a lot of uh, input from our community regarding, uh, you know, the state of, of things. and. It, one of the things that I know comes up a lot for Montgomery County is this notion that, you know, hey, you guys are always starting new programs. You're always starting, you know, but you're not scaling. You know, how come it's always adding, adding? I think that this hub model, um, and of course, I've been beating this drum for a long time, it's such a wonderful opportunity. Um, I, I think that it is a moment where we can take a step back to see you know, what are those services that we can funnel through these hubs? How can we strengthen it? Because the beauty of it is that is the geographical accessibility component and the trust that has been created. And so, you know, I'll, I'll use the Oak Chapel for it, you know, as an example. Um, uh, the feedback I got is that there were some concerns, et cetera, in terms of the service, you know, how many families, et cetera, which is a fair, fair observation. However, uh, that is, you know, a corridor, the Belpre corridor is, is one of the highest poverty corridors that we have in the, in, in the county. And so it was a matter of, you know, what do we say to those families now? Like, you know, well, go to this other one. Well, perhaps they don't have the ability to do that. But now that we've established that trust, it is going to be easier to do things like, you know, referrals, case management, um, you know, if there's if there are housing issues, it's it's just an opportunity. We always talk about this for no wrong door. Well, now we have it, and it's growing from the community. It's not something that we are imposing. So when we talk about strengthening these hubs or you know maintaining them, etc., I hope that you know the next council, with the leadership at HHS, continues to see this not just as a kind of temporary thing that, that we did and we kind of, you know, keep it funding it a little bit and let it go, but as an opportunity to consolidate because at the end of the day, we also will perhaps save money <laughs> because you are establishing that extraordinary um, partnership between people who may want to donate, organizations that may want to provide services through there, et cetera. And guess what? It is embedded in the community. I see this as an opportunity to connect with our regional services centers and perhaps even do an assessment to see where else in the county we might be able to stand up um, some more of these types of hubs. To me, that is the wave of the future, to be completely honest. Um, and, and we are so lucky that, you know, somebody was talking about what are the silver linings of the pandemic. To me, this is one of them. This really is one of them where very quickly people just went into let's pivot, let's be nimble, let's be flexible, and boom, right? Um, so anyway, just really wanted to stress that point um, because it is something that we're hearing a lot out there. And it's really cool to just point to these hubs as an opportunity and as a model um, that Montgomery County can definitely lead um, as well. 
Councilmember Navarro, I just wanted to just weigh in for just a second on that to say two points in time, come, two points in, in history come to mind for me. One of them was when I started, when I accepted this position, uh, when I was offered this position, you guys gave, were gracious okay. enough to give it to me. The, one of the points that I made was access and navigation were important mm -hmm. and to me and in terms of the department. And, and then the second one was when we started having a conversation about what consolidated hubs could mean across the department, across the county, as a resource and a way to connect residents at the local level with the resources that they needed, whether they were from the local provider community or whether they were connecting them to HHS for extended services that they might need. So from our perspective, and I think the county executive reflected it last year in the budget and making and putting them into the general fund budget, into our base budget, and then again this year with some additional support, the message is that these are here. This is a part of our infrastructure and a part of our, and a partner in our infrastructure that I expect and my goal will be to, to figure out how we strengthen and consolidate our operation and partnership going forward. So they're going to be with us for the time. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you brought up a good point about the federal funds you know, going away. But again, I think this is one of those opportunities where we can easily find consolidation and, 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 and savings. And I'll say that one moment that stands out for me during the pandemic was when you and I were having that conversation over the phone. You know, we were all virtual. It was it was lunchtime. We got on this call, and I was pacing in my backyard because I still have that memory. I was like pacing in my back, talking about you know how can this be stood up and everything. And so, you guys really did um, step up to partner and and, and facilitate it. And so, I, I want to thank your entire staff and, and your leadership as well. Uh, Councilor Katz, thank you very much. I just wanted to be on the Me Too uh, bandwagon on this one. You know, we have all seen firsthand um, really the the unbelievable partnerships that happened literally overnight. You know, they, they say it's that old joke, it takes a lifetime to become an overnight success, but it looked like it was overnight. And so many different groups from the private part, from the private uh, um, uh, in public from the private uh, partnerships to the public partnerships that that uh, we were able to do this and the other thing that is so necessary what well, one of the things that the hubs proved to us reminded all of us is there were people that needed government that never needed it before and they took it for granted and everybody thought well, you know there's there's plenty of food and there's plenty of diapers and there's plenty and there's not and and that not so that the people what we were serving the people who were serving them knew exactly what we needed to do and they all pivoted at to uh, to get us there the other thing that i i think is is very necessary to remind people is that when the hubs first began to councilmember navarro's point when the hubs first began everyone thought it was going to be short term and it just like this pandemic, that short term is a whole lot longer term than what we had ever planned. And I think that if we can use this as a model, we should use this as a model. And it, and it helps the people directly. And, and we can see directly what, need, what the needs are. So it was not just food. It was all things. So thank you very much. Consolidated hub is the frame we're using as opposed to hubs because there's so many things that we're calling hubs now that this is our, our, our language is around consolidated hubs, and it is not just about food. It's about all the other things that people need. Uh, I think um, the one thing that I, I would say about this is that we are facing what is going to be a long-term slow motion disaster. Um, we have, we, it's been slow motion for the last two years, but past the point where we stop looking at the, the numbers around COVID, we are still going to be dealing with the recovery. And there are elevated new needs that we've discovered, people with new needs that have never needed us before, and people who had needs that weren't being met before. So we expect there's some, some elevated need that will be with us for, for the foreseeable future. Now, the question is, are we better off with a slow motion disaster or a fast moving disaster? But, but that becomes a good question. <laughs> I'm in the, let's get it over with quick. <laughs> We're going to have to get it done with it. But I think this is, this is where we find ourselves, unfortunately. So we learned, we're learning a lot about how to fly this, build this plane as we fly it, but also at the same time, how to, how to just plan for the longer haul uh, of recovery that we're going to have to deal with. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. And uh, just wanted to chime in here. I, I agree with all my colleagues' comments. Uh, Dr. Kroll, as you were speaking about this topic, I remember getting those frantic calls from you and from the county executive and police chief when we had our, you know, the, the White Oak mass food distribution. Just it was a week or a few days after 
the one at the uh, grocery store that was a disaster as far as not in the, both in social need of people there, but just how unorganized and everyone was uh, very close, um, how far we've come uh, to being able to organize, set up these uh, distribution hubs, which obviously started with food, but have expanded to do so much and put the partnerships in place, you know, some with hub and spokes models and others. And I just want to first say, just commend you and your team. It's one of the many things that we didn't know we could do uh, prior to COVID or think that we had to do. Uh, you know, me talking to you right now is another one of them, uh, you know, and how we've been able to uh, include more people from our community uh, in, in ways that are convenient to them in our discussions. So uh, I'm glad that we're continuing the model. We're, we're going to have to monitor the needs. Uh, I think Councilman Navarro brings up a really important point about these smaller distribution sites that have people have gotten used to uh, and that where they know they can go. I have a similar concern on the food items, which I'll, you know, I'll, I'll wait to, to bring up. Um, but I think this is something that it's, it's a good thing that we've done. It's a great thing that we've done, uh, but we know the need has not abated. And I've said from the beginning, this is going to be not dissimilar to the uh, financial crisis of 2009, that this is gonna be a long tail. And I know you just alluded to that. So. Uh, I look forward to working with you as we work our way through this and appreciate the work of all your teams and all of the many, many folks who have stepped up to staff and uh, provide services to our community through these hubs over the last several years. Thank you. Thank you. I just, just wanted to say, take this moment to say how much we appreciate the partners who have, who have done that work and done the heavy lifting of standing up those sites and delivering that food and learning the lessons about how many people we're going to need, we're going to be coming, and how to manage that flow of people to make sure we get them in and out and get get their needs met as efficiently as possible. It was a nightmare the first few weeks, or the first few months maybe, um, but but they have they learned their lessons and they figured it out in a way that has, has made it smooth and efficient and and supportive of the folks that, that, that come come to their to their doorstep seeking support. So, looking forward to that Absolutely. continuing. Absolutely. Thank you, and I do want to thank uh, Councilman Navarro for lifting up the Oak Chapel issue um, on many different levels. And, you know, these have become gathering, cr creating senses of place too among the volunteers uh, and among the organizations. Uh, people just wanting to help but not sure exactly where to go. And there's value in, in addition to supporting the families that are coming as well. So it's good that we're, we're, we're gonna keep that going. Uh, one last question. On. Sure. Sorry, Mr. President. Uh, I'll add my voice to the chorus about uh, uh, the hubs, and just I want to really thank you and your team, and and uh, everybody in the private sector who's been involved in our our partners um, this year. Since I was going to ask this later, but Councilmember Rice mentioned baby formula and the current shortage, and um, I've been in touch with our staff and and wondering when we're going to get a lot of calls from constituents about this. And I know you can't solve every problem in the world, but uh, is there somebody at HHS that's thinking about this? And uh, I know a lot of this has been driven by the the recall, um, but that certainly could happen again. I don't know if anybody's assessed the likelihood of that happening again. Do we need a strategic petroleum reserve, a baby, baby formula in the county or something like that when more becomes available? I don't know what you know you experts are thinking about this, but it's a, it's a serious concern um, and it seems to be it is a serious Growing. concern, and, and, and to, your, to, to answer your the top level question, the one that I can answer is yes, we are thinking about it and looking at it and trying to figure out how do we how do we help our providers and our to resource additional baby formula. Uh, I think um, certainly in my staff, and I know the the food security task force is also thinking about it, um, and, and along with with our folks on the second floor. So it is it is something we are looking at. I don't know whether or not stock how feasible it is to stockpile, you know, the, uh, a supply, uh, but because I think it, it, is, it has shelf life and the question is, you know, how do we do that? But we are. Is there somebody on your staff we should stay in touch with um, about this? Because I anticipate getting a lot of. I would say that, that you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Vicki Buckland on this and, okay. and we will make sure that we, we, we can answer questions. We'll do. Right Thank you, Dr. Kroll. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to say really quick, the next item is the Office of Food Resilience. This crosses over into item 1.5, um, so we're going to hold off on that discussion until we get to item 1.5. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll move on then to page 10 of your packet. Um, 
the regarding food insecurity funding, there are two food um, items that are related to the DHHS budget that we'll touch on briefly. Um, the executive did uh, recommend $4 million of one-time funding in the department's budget to continue the county's response to food insecurity, uh, as well as an additional 250000 allocated to Nourishing Bethesda to continue to support its efforts. The committee did acknowledge and emphasize that certainly this recommended level of funding is significantly less than what has been experienced um, during the pandemic between uh, supplemental appropriations of federal, state, and local dollars, um, but really emphasized the need for this to be a transitional and a bridge amount of money and to continue the work with partners as has continually been discussed to understand um, what level of resources will be needed going forward uh, as this is again uh, sort of an initial bridge at this time pending uh, systemic work in a number of areas. That's the food insecurity item. The committee also did discuss, uh, discuss I apologize, request from Mana Food Center uh, and initially placed 100, 805000 on the reconciliation list to support some critical infrastructure needs for Mana Food Center uh, in three tranches as are outlined in your packet. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, as many of us have been deeply engaged in this work around continuing to fight for food security for our constituents. I really want to thank MANA, who's been a great partner, as so many of our nonprofits in this community have been. And MANA originally came to us with a $1 million request to enhance the services that we know are so important. They also uh, distribute formula, so just wanted to put that out there, another yet source of uh, great support for our community. Um, but I've been in contact with leadership there to where they actually want to amend their request. Uh, and so I'd like to propose that at this time. Uh, they actually feel as though they can actually find additional funding for the $230,000 to support the culturally appropriate food purchasing. And so they'd like to request that they that we remove that from the reconciliation list and instead just combine the last two for the staff training retention as well as the facility costs into $575,000 as one line item to help support MANA in its efforts to make sure that the critical infrastructure that's needed to help support our communities is there, and I'd like to move that at this time. Moved by Councilmember Rice, Second. seconded by Council Vice President Glass. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present and virtual. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Thank you. That brings us to the Minority Health Initiatives and Programs. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my fault. My fault. Sorry, Councilmember Juwanda. Uh, Councilmember Juwanda wanted to chime in. That's all right. I just want to make sure. I know you had moved one item. The money for food security, the $4 million, are we talking about that later? Or is that right now? I thought I heard it right now. It, it is. We just, yes. Yeah, okay. You just talked. You just said yes, that. Yes, I did. Um, so I just want to raise uh, the, the food security task force obviously requested $8 million. You know, you know, obviously there's, we have a, this whole budget is including our nonprofit community. It's all about great partners who have requested more than, than was necessarily sent over. And there's obviously there's great need. Uh, we know uh, with our last conversation that there's, we're still in a situation, uh, recent data coming out that we still have one in 10 in our region and, and in the county that are food insecure. Um, and we you know we used this federal money, which was a big, big help. Um, and obviously, it was we weren't going to be able to sustain those same levels. But you know, the thirteen million dollars that has been used over the last year to support food, obviously, we're not going to be able to meet that number. But going down to four million, uh, I know uh, I'm sure other colleagues have heard there's some significant concern. The request was eight million from the Food Security Task Force, uh, and I, I worry about many of these smaller providers that are community based that are nonprofits that have been doing it for years that we're going to have, you know, come July 1st, when these contracts run out on June 30th, some places that just aren't going to be giving out food anymore. And I'm really concerned about that. I know all of us are. I, I, I so I wondered, I, it's, it's kind of a question, but, and I would be willing to make a proposal to put some additional funding in tranches on the reconciliation list, but uh, is, is, it, to my colleagues in the HHS committee, I guess primarily, and to and or, and or staff, uh, and or HHS itself, how do you? Let's start with HHS. Let's start with that. How are we going to address that potential cliff? And 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 what 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 makes you confident, if you are, that the four million dollars 
will be enough to meet uh, the need that and the demand that's out there. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Uh, I think um, the the four million dollars represents our, our our starting point for this conversation. We are we are clear that there is a, an incredible demand for food out there, and we are also equally clear from the county executive that we should not have people going lagging and going wanting. So while there may be some consolidation around who's delivering service, uh, the food we will we will continue to keep an eye on working to make sure that there is food available for folks who have a, an ongoing need. Uh, I think that is. Uh, uh, I, I know there's a conversation with the Food Security Task Force that, that is coming up a little later that, that uh, uh, you may get some additional information on it, but um, the, the county executive is committed to the idea that people should not be, um, should not go without. So, so that if, if the $4 million isn't sufficient, I think that there's an opportunity for us to come back. You, you can expect that we would come back uh, if, we, if we feel like we can't manage it within our operating budget. Okay. Well, I. I think that you know, 13 million to 4 million. I, I just don't think that it will be enough. And I know that it's, it's this difference because we use federal money. So I, I, I don't know if colleagues would be interested or willing in putting a million, you know, million dollars in two million dollars in one million dollar tranches on the list. I just, I just don't know how. I think we're going to have to come back and do it anyway. But I've heard from, you know, significant concern over the last few days. Uh, about this, and, and obviously the request that still be two million under the request from the task force. Um, but if there was a, a willingness, I, I, I would be yeah. interested. Councilmember Juwando, I we're all there with you in, in theory and in principle and in heart and in soul. Uh, the challenge, of course, is we now have, um, I believe we've exceeded over $50 million on the reconciliation list. Um, and I don't want to signal to the incredible providers that are out there that there is a likelihood based on the tr extreme challenges we have within the reconciliation list. I think as as um, Director Kroll noted, and the HHS remains fully committed, uh, and we have done this sporadically throughout the entire uh, pandemic, um, is to convene as necessary uh, and see what more is needed. We, we do find ourselves in this terrible predicament as other jurisdictions do across the country that the federal funding that has been a lifeline uh, is, is drying up. Um, and it does unfortunately appear that at the moment, uh, there is not significant interest in Capitol Hill in replenishing some of those funds in the short term. So I think uh, we we are going to maintain consistently staying on top of this issue. And in a moment, um, just underscoring how important this is, we're going to talk about the Office of Food Resiliency, uh, which will help po provide a better roadmap both within the county but also among these providers so that we can strategically make these investments uh, where they are needed the most. Um, and so I, I'm just sensing from colleagues, um, uh, Councilmember Jawando, that there's tremendous interest in this, um, but interest in, in revisiting it um, as quickly as possible immediately after the budget and keeping tabs all the way through, um, recognizing where we are now in the budget process. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, I will defer to your sense of the room there. Um, and I can kind of see everybody. Uh, but Dr. Kroll, I would ask just to the to council president's point that, you know, very soon that you send the council, the council, the plan, you know, I, can you address the point about July 1st and like what's going to happen when some of these contracts expire and what the transition plan is? I, I can't give you specifics on that right now, but but we'll do that. We can send you that uh, in, in an update afterwards. I think all of us. Yeah, just very soon. I just think to the point of this is something that it's we're going to hear about it in, 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 in a month. You know, so I just think we need to make sure that we, we all are clear on the plan and we can adjust and be nimble because, uh, as the council president said, we're all very interested in this. Okay, so I appreciate it. I just wanted to bring voice to it and uh, we'll, we will circle back. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Thank you. That takes us to the next issue um, regarding the minority health initiatives and programs. Um, the executive's budget did include funding increases for all of the minority health initiatives and programs, uh, and that the, the committee supported the executive's recommended FY23 funding increases. Important to note that this recommendation does include uh, an amendment that the executive sent over on April 28th of $707,000 for the African American Health Program. Uh, these funds are placed on the reconciliation list as a matter of practice uh, in the council's budgeting process. But again, the committee's recommendation does reflect support for all of those increases. 
I will just uh, also the committee emphasized, of course, the deep and shared commitment to carry forward the work of all of these initiatives and programs. And again, understanding that this is an area where um, so many people have stepped up in so many ways, wanting to really continue to receive updates on that work uh, and to take a comprehensive approach, approach throughout the coming year to understand what resources and strategies are needed to continue to address this again in this transitional space. I'll just briefly touch on the highlights of each of the, of the areas. The, uh, for, in regards to the Asian American Health Initiative, the committee supported the executive's recommended increase of 1.2 million in FY23 uh, for this initiative. On the top of page 11, and again, there are additional details in this packet as well as in the committee's packet. On the top of page 11, the committee did discuss and support the executive's recommended increase of 2.2 million in FY23 for the Latino Health Initiative and did discuss also uh, the request from the steering committee for additional funding in this area. Thank you. Um, sorry, what, keep going. <laughs> the uh, Black Physicians Health Network, the county executive's recommendation includes 2.5 million to ensure that this has the capacity to implement and culturally tailored model which serves the black communities within Montgomery County. And then in regards to the African American Health Program, the committee did support, again, uh, the March 15th budget submission as well as the April 28th budget amendment for an FY23 increase in total of just over $1 million, $1057 million uh, in the African American Health Program. Thank you. And let me just chime in here really quick. So one of the important well, let me take two steps backward, and I know Councilmember Navarro wants to speak to this as well. Um, I just can't thank enough our Minority Health Initiatives and Program for the way that they have so heroically stepped forward. Uh, thank God we had that infrastructure and foundation going into the pandemic, and each of those respective organizations leaned in and performed extraordinarily well uh, throughout the pandemic and provided bridges to the community that the county government cannot provide on its own. So uh, their work was truly amazing. And speaking of which, um, and I've talked about this publicly before, people often ask me, you know, what are the things you're proud of, you know, in, in working in county government? And the development of Pornorsha Salud y Bienestar is, is at the top of the list for me personally. And working on that collaboratively with Councilmember Navarro will remain uh, one of the highlights for me in my first term of um, the incredible collaboration and the tremendous leadership of the community uh, the way that they came together uh, to combine efforts and strategically make recommendations that have been expanded. Uh, and as Councilmember Navarro noted earlier, the silver lining of the hubs, this is another one um, that, that really is going to be extraordinary and, and, and outlive all of us coming out of the pandemic. In that vein, uh, one of the things that we had talked about in the committee specifically as it relates to the Latino Health Initiative and Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar, um, and understandably there were requests made across the board uh, beyond our ability to fund all of them because we are not able to meet the delta of the federal funds that we have lost uh, with county funds that we currently have available, but we do appreciate the county executive's tremendous investment in this area and the expansion. But there are two line items in particular um, that were compelling to us, and we had asked uh, the Department of Health and Human Services to see if there was any way uh, they could absorb these two line items. And understandably, they came back and said, unfortunately, they cannot. And so there are two additional items that I will request now that we put forward on the reconciliation list. One is you know, that term, build it and they will come, uh, the Latino Health Initiative established a hotline um, that has been tremendously successful beyond just issues related to the pandemic and has been a catch-all for many community residents who are in crisis uh, and get somebody on the other end of that line who not only speaks Spanish, but immediately can connect and uh, uh, connect them to different services that are available. The funding that had initially been allocated helped build the system, but it has significantly seen growth since then. And so if we fund it at current levels, then that will mean the hotline will diminish its ability to be able to serve the number of calls that they are receiving right now, which would set us back. And so I'd like to propose that we include $150,604 on the reconciliation list to keep the information line at its current programmatic level 
and see what more we can do moving forward as we continue to build out that system. The second item is $104,994 for a program coordinator. Uh, we have relied on the incredible volunteerism and organic coordination among all of the respective agencies in this space. But as has been true in um, our other uh, minority health initiatives, we, we, we feel, there's a feeling that there needs to be somebody who is permanently in place who can help coordinate those efforts so that we can remain strategic moving forward and not just rely on uh, the good graces and the volunteerism and tremendous leadership of community leaders. Um, but there needs to be somebody who's consistently coordinating these efforts moving forward. So, colleagues, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to request that someone move um, two items to the reconciliation list, the 150604 for the information line and 104994 for the program coordinator. So moved by Councilmember Reamer, seconded by Councilmember Hucker. Um, I'll uh, stop there and I'll turn over to Councilmember Navarro since we're in the discussion point and uh, have her make some comments. Thank you very much. I absolutely, of course, support this um, and wanted to also echo uh, the comments regarding this extraordinary um, element of the response to the pandemic. I think uh, for me personally, this really goes under the category of, you know, government indeed can be nimble. Government can indeed learn from all of the lessons uh, and uh, in all of the discussions and the feedback from the public and act very quickly. Um, and wow, look at the results. I mean, nationally, this is absolutely an incredible model and one that again, we have to continue to strengthen because um, it is very true. The effects of the pandemic are not over. Um, the issues that are, especially with those families who already were quite vulnerable uh, are still very much uh, a concern and, and there's still a sense of, of, of emergency. So, so I do want to go on record again, uh, thanking all of these partners uh, and thanking the community for also stepping up and trusting in the process uh, and all those that could give, they did. And so what, what an example, you know, and for me personally, this is definitely one of those moments where I just, I'm just so grateful and so humbled to have been here during that time to just help facilitate this. That was it. It was helping to facilitate it because everybody else, including the, uh, the leadership at HHS, HHS uh, uh, employees, uh, everyone who came together really deserve all the credit for making this happen. So um, I, I just really want to make sure that this is something that, of course, continues uh, beyond and, and it's I feel like this is literally the nucleus, right? From here, we can truly expand. Um, and I feel the same way about the African-American health program because the reality was that when we had that first conversation with some of the partners about this Latino health initiative, it was not about a COVID-19 health initiative. It was about how can we address the disproportionality in our black and Latino community? And so the conversation immediately went to how can we tailor a very strategic and intentional uh, approach in these in, in these communities. And, and in that meeting, I made it clear that we could do the same for our black community. Obviously, you would adapt it because the idea was to customize it. Um, and and I, I appreciate Councilmember Joanda and Councilmember Rice, um, who who I shared this this thought, you know, everything was super fluid, but it was like, hey, there is this opportunity here, here is the template, let's do this, and it also went forward. So the African American Health Initiative deserves a lot of credit as well uh, for creating this African American Health Program uh, and, uh, and all of those particular components. Um, one quick question I had, I know we have two separate uh, sort of items, the Black Physicians Health Network and the African American Health Program. And um, so are, are, I thought the, the Black Physicians Health Network was kind of folded into the African American Health Program in terms of the support, but they're kind of separately in the in the packet. Um, are, has there been a, a change or is this just a way to maintain this very important uh, initiative sort of beyond just the African American Health Program purview? 
Sure. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Navarro, uh, and, and happy to clarify. For uh, the, there was a decision made to put both elements of this into the budget line item under African American Health Program. However, these are two discrete operations at this point. There's the African American okay. Health Program that will continue its work with the expanded resources that you heard us describe uh, that, that the CE has <laughs> recommended. Uh, but the Black Physicians Health Network is a separately operated and managed piece that will, will operate and exist under uh, in the public health service area, be managed through the public health service area. Got it. I appreciate that very much. My closing comment. Uh, I, I'm oh, sorry. Let me just say that the, the two programs uh, interlac interact and overlap with each other in ways that help to help ensure that as the African American Health Program is doing its public health mission of promotion and pro promotion of wellness and prevention of, of disease, when there's a need to refer to the Black Physicians Health Network for, for tertiary care, for primary care, for other kinds of care, those two, they will work in tandem with each other. What an incredible resource. Um, and in closing, what I will say is that, you know, related to uh, this discussion about the effects of the pandemic not being over in the public health space, you know, long COVID, uh, it, it, is, it is real. Uh, and I think, uh, especially again, when we're talking about these communities, um, it, it will be important to start crafting some messages and also some support around that, um, because sometimes it's not, it's not completely apparent that maybe that is what's happening. And um, so, so I do, you know, I, I do think that that's that's going to be uh, something that perhaps we need to begin to talk about a little bit, um, because it's definitely uh, an issue that that requires uh, some some education and also some some care um, before it, it becomes something a, a bit you know more serious. We did not discuss it during the public health portion of the budget, but I think I know for a fact that one of the things that Dr. Bridgers and his team are looking at now is what's the research telling us about long COVID and how can we message to the public about the, the potential and about recognizing it, but also how do we message to providers who are mm -hmm. in health, but also in other allied fields about how to recognize what the, and interpret what they're seeing as, as potentially long COVID. Exactly. So it's, uh, it's part of our growth and planning in the next year about how we message that out to, to, our, to the community. Wonderful, thank you. And of course I do support the, the motion. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Chawando. Thank you. Uh, I obviously I support the motion as well, and I'm just very uh, happy that we've been able to stand these programs up with the leadership of colleagues, and I've certainly been happy in the role that I've been able to play with Councilman Bryce on the African American Health Program and the Black Physicians Network. I, I'm excited about the new uh, doctors and engagement and, and the ramping up of great programs that were already happening in the African American Health Program. It's just, I think, the, the exact right time. Um, and we have to do it uh, to the point of, of long COVID. I'm glad you raised that. Um, we know that that uh, some of the early research out, and I've seen this in my own household with uh, uh, my father-in-law who has long COVID. Um, it can lead to other. It can lead to you know mental health challenges. It can lead to other health challenges. Uh, and if we're not addressing and, and getting people into care and making sure they have the information. Uh, we're going to see disparities grow, I fear. And, and so it's a, it's a really important time to double down on these programs, uh, particularly in our Latino and African-American black communities. So just pre appreciate the motion, appreciate the work of my colleagues, Councilman Navarro and Councilman Albanaz and Rice and the entire council for realizing, and the county executives for realizing the importance of these. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And Councilmember Rice is now joining us virtually. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much. And that's the power of the technology in person one minute and virtual the next. But uh, certainly just wanted to echo the comments of all of my colleagues and just double down on this uh, notion that, again, if we had not been instrumental in terms of laying a foundation of support, recognizing like Council Member Jawando highlighted that racism was a public health crisis doubling down on what it is that we needed to do to try and undo some of the systemic racism that then affected the public health of so many in our marginalized communities, we would not be in this situation where we get to talk about reinforcing great programs that are producing great results. We'd be talking about trying to create programs to be responsive to these needs that we're seeing in our community. And I'm just so proud to be in a place where we see and highlight and want to thank all of my colleagues as well as all of the great uh, people who represent the African American Health Program, the Asian American Health Initiative, the Latino Health Initiative, our Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar, 
All of these kinds of things are there and in place to make sure that we can keep a level playing field for our folks when it comes to public health. And so just supportive of this uh, motion, but more importantly, supportive of the notion that we have across the board in terms of understanding that we have to do a little bit more for our communities of color, our communities that are socially uh, and economically impacted, and that we're doing that and doubling down on those efforts. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous Aye. among all those present and virtual. All right, thank you. Uh, that moves us to uh, some other changes in the administrative area. Uh, I'm on the bottom of page 11 of your packet. The committee supported the executive's recommendation to shift 40 grants totaling $2.1 million from the community grants NDA to the base budget of the department. The committee supported the executive's recommendation to add just over $2 million related to a number of very critical uh, replacement and upgrade of hardware and software associated with some very critical uh, systems, information systems in the department. Uh, DHHS did work uh, with the Department of Technology and Enterprise Business Solutions on both a risk assessment of the current state as well as uh, to design the solution and recommended funding. The committee supported uh, a couple of infrastructure pieces to uh, support increasing workload and scope and complexity of DHHS programmatic increases. This adds $246,000 in three positions to both the contract and human resource teams and $91,000 in one position uh, to continue to maintain the DHHS website to uh, allow for timely access to information. Committee supported the executive's recommendation to shift the legal representation program to the community engagement cluster, uh, and this is consistent with the approval of a legal services coordinator uh, in the newcomers assistance appropriation the council took up separately. The committee did review uh, some additional additions uh, that council members brought forward. Um, the, the committee supported uh, Council President Albernoz's proposed support for the Crossing Paths program, placed $60,000 on the reconciliation list to reduce senior isolation. Council Member Glass had received communication from the DC Diaper Bank re requesting additional funds of $150,000 uh, to expand their um, support beyond uh, two organizations that are not part of the Hub Model Network. Council Vice President Glass, I want to talk about this. Thank one. you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. I, I was waiting until we brought up uh, this particular line item to uh, revisit the conversation about baby formula, uh, because uh, the DC, uh, the, the Greater DC Diaper Bank is uh, one of the leading nonprofits in in our region that help provide baby formula to those who need it the most. Uh, thousands of pounds have been provided, and just a statistic to share with everybody that back in uh, 2021, just last year, uh, they helped 2,500 babies through our hub, uh, through our hub network, and then through their 14 nonprofit partners, they aided and supported uh, more than 11,000 infants. And so as we talk about the greater needs and the supply chains, uh, this organization is helping uh, get food into babies' mouths, uh, baby formula, and diapers and other things, and just wanted to elevate that and bring it back into the conversation. Thank you. And finally, for this section of the packet, Councilmember Friedson uh, has, had wrote, written a memorandum to the committee proposing that 132,000 be added to the reconciliation list for community farm share, uh, which collaborates with linkages to learning and MCPS to uh, increase, uh, to, to bring weekly fresh produce bags from local farms to families. That concludes this portion of DHHS, uh, and we would move on to the Guaranteed Income NDA. Okay. Go on. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is an, a non-departmental account for the Guaranteed Income uh, pilot program, which is uh, uh, a pilot that the, I'm sorry, the council had initially approved uh, an appropriate, a special appropriation of nearly $2 million to initiate this pilot program. Uh, that was 
an FY22 appropriation. However, that did specify that the funds would be placed in an account that would be reappropriated in 23 and 24. And as a result, all of the funding will be available to complete this program as it moves forwards over the coming years. Uh, the committee supported the executive's recommended FY23 addition to this of $2.563 million um, and heard uh, a great deal about the implementation of this pilot from the stakeholders and implementation groups that uh, have been working to implement um, the parameters to, to carry out this program. Uh, the fully estimated cost for the 24-month pilot is $6.8 million, but of this amount, it's critical to note this that there is uh, a Meyer Foundation a uh, contribution of a million dollars as a public-private partnership. I'll just speak to this very briefly, I promise, and Councilmember Jawanda wants to chime in too. There's been a lot of heavy lifting to get us to this point um, because this is an entirely new initiative and will be um, just staffed well, um, but also uh, we're going to be tracking outcomes all the way through. Um, and I want to thank the tremendous collaboration and partnership among all of the respective agencies. We've this particular initiative has gotten a lot of notice, uh, in both in our region and across the country. Um, as, as a county, we'll be one of the first to, to, to embark in this effort, and I think it will be a paradigm shift in the best possible way in how we address um, just financial insecurity uh, and this, this, this cycle of poverty that we can't seem to get out of in certain situations. I think this is really going to contribute to that. Uh, Council Member Juwando. Thank you, Council President, and uh, couldn't agree with you more. It's been great to, to work with you and, and all of our colleagues on this. I want to thank the team at HHS, uh, Amanda Harris and and, and Richen and, and, and Dr. Kroll and all of the many people uh, who have gotten this the, to this point. Uh, also, you know, obviously Pam Luckett on our staffs, uh, but you're right, this is, uh, this is going to be a game changer. Uh, you know, since we announced it, Baltimore has announced that they are going to be pursuing a program. But I, I love the uniqueness of ours that we're going to be helping folks in the continuum of care, homeless or formerly homeless, or, uh, uh, and, uh, and then as 100 of them and 200 other families. And we're getting very close to, to launching that first cohort uh, here in, in the next several uh, months and weeks and months. And so uh, just really appreciate the County Executive's partnership and the Meyer Foundation, Aberration Council, all the partners. There's a lot of cooks in this kitchen, but it's a good thing because it will be a, a something I think that will transform how we provide support and relieve pressure so people can achieve their full potential uh, and improve their economic standing for themselves and their families. So really appreciate this and, and, and glad it's uh, moving forward for now we have secure funding and I think there's more funding to come from the philanthropic community as well, uh, in addition to the Meyer Foundation. So I want to thank everyone for their support there as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And big shout out to my colleague, Beth Schumann, uh, who's done some heavy lifting representing our office on this too. Okay, we're moving on to items re reviewed by the joint HHS and ENC committees. They met on April 22nd and May 9th to review uh, school-based services or partnerships among Department of Health and Human Services, MCPS, and community partners. The following recommendations were put forward by the Joint Committee. The first item is related to mental health and social support services for high school students. This recognizes the need for that high school students need these kinds of supports that have been exacerbated by the pandemic and the council as well as the board of education have discussed and identified this area as of, of, of extreme concern so the first item that was recommended by the executive and supported by the joint committees is the addition of nine hundred twenty thousand five hundred and sixty five dollars to open the wellness center at kennedy high school at the beginning of the next school year the second item is uh, increase of $3,726,180 for mental health and case management services at 10 priority high schools without an existing high school wellness center. Um, the funding also supports mental health first aid trainings and youth stabilization services through Shepherds, Pratt's Care and Connections for Families. In addition, the Joint Committee placed $5,326,010 on the reconciliation list 
to support Council Member Navarro's proposal to expand interim mental health case management and positive youth development services through the street outreach network and community-based organizations to all high schools um, without existing high school wellness center services. Ms. Yeah, if you could pause there, I'm gonna turn it over to Councilmember Navarro sure. uh, to speak to this important item. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, so of course, I think we just had a really uh, wonderful and robust conversation about the hubs and what is actually the uh, importance of those types of models and basically access is what's so critical. Uh, in, in specifically when you talk about you know real vulnerable populations, however, in this case, I think we can all agree that um, it is really a need across the board, right? That although we know that issues that were already affecting a lot of our youth, um, that we sometimes you know do talk about at-risk youth, we know that those have been exacerbated into levels that are quite concerning. But we also know that there are a lot of young people who are also being affected in terms of mental health challenges and emotional challenges regarding uh, the isolation and the trauma around loss and things of that nature. So this particular um, proposal really is comprehensive in terms of who they will benefit. But it is important to also recognize something. And today there is a Washington Post article and it is titled, Gang Feud in Montgomery County Turns Deadly Prosecutors Say. I actually had a someone who works in county government uh, who you know does, does a lot of cleaning and things of that sort literally wait for one of my staff members who is bilingual in order to ask for help because her 12-year-old niece was missing and it was actually hanging out with some other youth that had a gun. And this aunt was desperate. Now just think about that, 12 years old. And so this article in the Washington Post actually does highlight some really very serious issues that, that, that are taking place in our community. We knew during the pandemic that this was going to put into motion a lot of risky, threatening issues surrounding a lot of our vulnerable youth. We knew that. We heard about it. Think about this. When the schools closed, so they were out there in the community. Many of this youth are in households, are already very unstable. And so not only were you dealing with the health issue, but you were dealing with emotional, mental, and then your life is at risk because you're being recruited into these multinational gangs. So what can we do about this? I mean, this is a very complex issue. And Montgomery County has led the way because this is not the first time that we've had these types of waves. However, at this moment, it's not just about the gang recruitment. It's also about all of these mental and emotional challenges that our youth are experiencing. Some of them make decisions about taking their own lives because they just can't deal with it anymore. That is the reality here. This particular proposal is not the end all be all, but it begins once again to put in place an infrastructure where we can start strengthening some of these services within the school building. And I have not forgotten about middle schools because actually the data is showing that we're seeing a lot of issues there as well. So the idea is that these, these wellness centers in the high schools can provide almost like a hub model to them also be able to leverage some services into the middle schools so that we can then move forward with, with expanding the, the wellness centers in the middle schools and strengthening things like Lincoln just to learning in our schools. So what is the bottom line here? What is the common denominator is access. It's ensuring that we are incorporating comprehensive holistic services that are accessible to everyone, that don't impose a burden, especially to those students who may be in family units where they, we cannot tell them, you know, please go to the crisis center, take three buses. What we're saying is it's available for you right here. Positive youth development is going to be super important. How lucky are we? to have a model already in Montgomery County 
that has been touted nationally, the Street Outreach Network. It's mentioned in this article. We are so fortunate to have this program. But lo and behold, every single year, we have to do this heavy lift of strengthening a program that actually is providing the results that we need. The idea is that as we take advantage of what the executive has included here for mental health and case management, you know, take advantage of the expansion, et cetera, that we do that, that we continue to strengthen social workers, mental health professionals, et cetera. But there is a component that is absolutely necessary. Let's not fool ourselves. And it's this positive youth development, these specialists, because not all students sometimes feel comfortable, you know, going to like, I don't know, a social worker, I don't know. But guess what? We know that out there in the community, these positive youth development specialists, they connect with these students. Why? Because they feel seen. They feel seen. They, they are able to connect and understand issues that sometimes nobody talks about. So we have a nationally recognized model, Street Outreach Network, which I think we should now call it for the school, Schools Outreach Network. Um, and that is what this seeks to accomplish. It's that it won't just be mental health professionals, which we wanna have, that's gonna be important. That is a component. I'm not saying that we're not gonna have that. We are absolutely gonna have that. But the positive youth development component is absolutely key because of the population that we are serving. These are our customers, these are our children. So that is what this is about. We did approve funding in FY22 to begin the process. The idea is that this funding continues that effort so that when students come back next school year, um, there will be this kind of support available embedded in the school building. It connects to what we have heard from teachers, right? So it's connected to our education system. We know that the stress is real. We know that the burnout is real. And what we want to avoid are more 14, 15, 16 year olds in the headlines. It breaks my heart every time I see that, who are actually falling prey to multinational gangs that are preying on them. 12, 14, 16, I mean, this is really, truly extraordinary. So all I'm saying here is that I wish it was hyperbole, but it's not. I wish this was drama, but it's not. It's just the facts. Just look it up. This is a very modest investment in strengthening a model that we know works because we've been supporting this wellness center uh, concept since I know for me when we did you know the whole Wheaton High School uh, uh, build out, etc. Brand new school. I made sure you know that we all work together to embed this space, but also the services, and it has worked. That's what we're doing here. Shame on us if we don't do this. And also shame on us if we don't make sure that the street outreach network is expanded to provide this support to our students. It is critical that we do that. So that's what this is about. I do have a question for uh, either Ms. Yao or Ms. Uh, 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 Ms. McGuire. I am a little concerned about how this rolls out in terms of, because again, I think that we've been on record pretty well with social workers and things like that, but in terms of the Street Outreach Network, is there a language that we can include, budget language, that specifically points to this notion that positive youth development must be a central component and the Street Outreach Network must be that model? That, by the way, schools actually, principals are, are asking them to come in. They just don't have the capacity, right? So I just want to make sure that the budget language is clear, since I'm not going to be here next year, <laughs> um, so that we do actually expand that in that way at fidelity. Um, and so that at least, once again, it's not the panacea. I understand that. But this is just the beginning of us building out something that our students can will know, and our teachers and our administrators and our support service personnel will know that there is this presence there um, for them. 
thank you for indulging me, Mr. President, but I just, you know, when I read this article today, again, it just breaks my heart. Uh, and at the same time, I just think that we are oh so fortunate Dr. Kroll, with your leadership, so fortunate that we have these programs that we can then expand. That we're, just, we're not starting from scratch. That is the silver lining here. And, um, and so with that, thank you so much. Um, and yes, if we can make sure that we do include language uh, there, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, breaks my heart too. Um, and as you have as well, Councilman Nevada, I've been in this space for 20 years and I've never seen what we're seeing right now. So um, this is a crisis. Uh, it requires immediate and complete and full attention as it has. Um, and uh, I'm going to follow up with you after today's session. I have some ideas I want to share with you. So thank you. Uh, we'll make sure to get that budget language in. Um, the next item is, again, another item. Oh, Council Member Reamer. Oh. I just wanted to express appreciation for Council Member DeVar for her comments and her work on this for many years and building up the street outreach program over many years. Um, and it just, uh, you know, we do need to do this. You know, we have a school safety and mental health crisis, and we the answer to that has to be doing more. It, it can't be doing less. And so, you know, just uh, I really am glad that there is a consensus strategy here to add resources to the schools for very effective programs that put professionals in the school that's, that kids, you know, that are successful at reaching children. I think that's the critical element here, is that these are professionals who know how to break through with kids and kids want to talk to and they, they, they can hang out with them and be seen with them and it's all good, you know, whoever they are. And like that, that's what we need in our schools. So, um, you know, I, I'm really strongly supportive of this initiative and I appreciate it being before us. Thank you. Uh the Joint Committee supported the recommendation from the Executive uh, to, for the Bienvenidos Newcomers Initiative, again, serving vulnerable youth and families in the county. The amount is $4,421,227. It's approximately a million dollar increase from the fiscal year 22 budget. These, this increase is primarily due to annualization of budgeted amounts in 2423. Um, the executive has also recommended and the Joint Committee supports adding two new linkages to learning sites, one at Odessa Shannon Middle School for an amount of $359,427, and the second one at the new Gaithersburg Elementary School, which would be a cost of $271,199. The Joint Committee supported uh, uh, several adjustments for school health services which build on a multi-year effort to ensure that the school health services is pro providing adequate level of support for students. The first item is $830,253 to convert 10-month school health staff to full-time in order to support the growth in MCPS summer programs. There's $646,547 that is being added for six school health nurses to address staffing shortages and meet the policy goal of having a school nurse in every high school, in every middle school, and every large, the largest elementary schools. There is $170,959 to add two positions to support the timely and consistent training of school health staff and the mentoring of new staff. Going forward, there's also, um, those are the HHS budget items that the Joint Committee reviewed. Um, well, in addition to that, they recommended the support for the budgets for Head Start, child care subsidies, the cluster projects, and child and adolescent school and community-based services. Moving forward, the, the Joint Committee reviewed the Early Care and Education NDA for a total amount of support in 23 of $10,992,589. The total resources available in 23 
is actually 19.9 million because unspent amounts in the NDA are then reappropriated into next year. So they're anticipating uh, a level of, of uh, funding that is not is not going to be spent. And in fact, the executive is anticipating using that unspent funds um, to seed a community development financial institution fund to support child care operations and improve sustainability of programs. In addition, there are some other highlights of what is being planned in, for using funds from the NDA, and they include 3.36 million for a subsidy seats pilot, $630,360 as a one-time support for summer programming for SNAP and recreation programs, $341,600 for a new family involvement center at the Caulfield Community Center, and sorry, $99,200 for outreach to pediatricians and clinics to increase the screening of young children for developmental disabilities and referrals for services. Keep going. Yep, just okay. go and wrap up. Okay. <laughs> yes. The last item then is the support for the executive's recommended uh, funding for the Children's Opportunity Fund uh, and the Early Care and Education Coordinating Entity. This includes $115,570 and a position to administer the contract with the Early Care and Education Coordinating Entity. And this is in Early Childhood Services uh, in DHHS. Then there's $425,000 uh, in the COF NDA, and that includes an increase of $50,000 that's targeted for Imagination Library as a grant um, to match state funds. And finally, there's uh, $284,451, an increase of approximately $30,000 in multi-program adjustments for operating support for in the Children, Youth, and Family Services budget. The Joint Committee supported these uh, budget adjustments, but they also indicated their support to change operating budget language describing COF to give the executive flexibility to structure appropriate contractual relationships and use funding to support the existing and future responsibilities of COF as it transitions to the independent 501c3 nonprofit corporation that is going to be the county's early care and education coordinating entity. Right. The Joint Committee also supported conditioning the release of fiscal year 23 funds upon a written report to the council describing how the county will be disseminating funding to support COF, uh, including you know, organizations contracting with the county, types of contractual arrangements, um, and, and amounts and descriptions of the services that will be provided. Thank you so much, Ms. Yao. Um, just a quick time check. I know a couple of colleagues have indicated they have a hard stop pretty close to 12. We have two more items that hopefully won't take very long, but I just want to note that timing issue. Um, I will turn over to Councilman Navarro, who has some, uh, would like to make a comment. Absolutely, I'd like to make a comment. Mm -hmm. um, wow, this, this is a very important uh, milestone in Montgomery County. Yes. Um, when I began, to work in this space, uh, being the co-founder of a nonprofit organization working in early care and education, it was the year 2000. Uh, and as I began to develop that particular uh, work, there was a lot of vibrant um, activity going on in the county surrounding early care and education. And then we kind of went into a plateau. Uh, there wasn't really a lot going on. And it was strange because at the same time, we were tracking all of the school readiness data and realizing that this academic achievement gap really is present, right, when children enter kindergarten. And so here we tried, you know, we tried, we worked really hard. Um, previous council worked really hard. Council member Reamer, I know, spearheaded some important pieces of legislation. I joined in with some uh, complementary efforts and we all really did what we could. Um, but there, we, didn't, we didn't have a comprehensive approach to this. And, and I think for me, what really, truly was a turning point was um, 
being a commissioner at the White House uh, Commission for Educational Excellence for Hispanics under President Obama and helping craft a number of summits around how do you involve the private sector, but how do you make this a bipartisan issue, right? Because it's always seen as just, you know, a, a woman's responsibility, right? Personal responsibility to deal with childcare and early care and education. And so we do need, we needed to involve the private sector. Um, and it was that summit in Miami where I, I walked away with two main thoughts. One is we need to reframe how we talk about early care and education, change the narrative, right? That this is an economic imperative, really a socioeconomic imperative. This is 2011. And number two, that we need to figure out how to have a dedicated funding stream and, and then look at governance for us. And so I, I learned, it was, it was former executive Leggett that early on in my first months serving pulled me aside and said, sometimes you gotta be patient, work, work your way through it. Um, and I learned that you had to do that. Um, so here we are, you know, <clears throat> is it everything I wanted us to, 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 to do at this point in time? Perhaps not completely, but it's very close. And, and I do thank the executive for, for um, believing in this process and my colleagues for believing in this process. This four year action plan that I authored is meant to provide that structure so we can move it forward and we can, we can scale it up and we can strengthen it. It has really the collaboration and, and, and input of all my colleagues. And the last piece was this notion of the governance structure. And it was just so wonderful that at the same time, MMF pivoted from workforce development into early care and education, uh, which then allowed for them to play a really important role in this designation of a coordinating entity that can help us leverage private funding, that can help us look at innovation and things of that nature. Not an easy thing to do. I always knew this was gonna be the hardest lift, but I think we have arrived at a pretty decent place. And hey, $19.9 million, that's, that's a pretty, important number. Because remember that for every dollar that we invest, the research is very clear, six to seven dollars in return. For me, the most important thing is what this will do for so many of our young, you know, children. Um, so really have to say thank you uh, to, to everyone because this was, has been a labor of love. Um, but I am just, again, so humbled to have played a, a role in something that I just continue to feel very passionate about. And I think Montgomery County now has a good foundation to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Navarro. It's really important to note that. And uh, we do appreciate that leadership. And we have arrived at a really important place and uh, want to thank everybody who's been involved in this effort. So with that, uh, we have um, uh, committee and joint committee recommendations. There were some amendments. And so I will need a motion to accept the Committee and Joint Committee recommendations as amended. Make it a motion. So moved by Councilmember Navarro, seconded by Councilmember Hucker. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous Aye. among all those present and virtual. Great. Uh, that moves us on to item number 1.5. I will tee this up um, and uh, turn it over to Councilmember Navarro. We're going to tag team this. Um, this is one of those issues that crosses over into multiple agencies. Uh, we're going to be joined by Dr. Earl Stoddard, but let me provide just a little bit of context. So in the midst of the pandemic, uh, we saw crushing need emerge in communities across the county for food. And we were fortunate to have an infrastructure in place through community-based organizations, including the Food Council, that were quickly and understandably overwhelmed by what we were seeing. And so an action was formed led by the Office of Emergency Management and Dr. Stoddard at the time that stood up quickly uh, an effort within county government to help work with those community-based organizations and nonprofit providers to better strategically align the federal funding that was coming in, the resources that were being made available, and so that it could get out to the community as quickly as possible. That model that was developed organically uh, was extraordinary. Uh, and helped reinforce a system of care that has served as truly a national model. In fact, Congressman Raskin has been talking about this from the House floor, uh, what we are doing here in Montgomery County. And so there is a strong interest in ensuring that we continue that continuity of service and an acknowledgement from the providers and the Food Council that it's county government that 
is in it's important that there be a single point of contact to coordinate the various efforts of county government but also be able to disseminate and share data to be able to better connect to our federal partners so that we can remain nimble and build on this existing infrastructure uh, that has been established. And so I was thrilled to see that the county executive has recommended the development of an office to codify and formalize. Uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to it as a program. Uh, I'm going to refer to it as a program uh, for purposes of this discussion because there is, we understand, legislation that will be forthcoming in the, in, in the, ve in the very near term uh, from the executive branch that will officially designate this particular entity in the way that it should be, because um, at the moment it's just a program. Um, we all There's also a discussion as to where this should live uh, and whether it's in the executive branch or the Office of uh, Community Partnerships, um, there's an acknowledgement that this office needs to be in a position which has been acknowledged by HHS that it shouldn't just be an HHS because this crosses over into housing, this crosses over into recreation, it crosses over into libraries, it crosses over into our housing partners and faith-based organizations. So with all of that as context, um, there are just a couple decision points before us today, uh, reaffirming the budget of this particular program uh, and an acknowledgement that it will be officially converted to an office soon. Dr. Stoddard, before we start for further context, could you just confirm when we are going to be receiving uh, the formal legislation that will establish this as an office rather than just a program? Having spent time earlier this week drafting it, I would expect by the end of the month you'll, you'll, the council will have a great submission. Perfect. So um, with that as context, uh, Chair Navarro, uh, I just, uh, that was the HHS part. I'll turn it over to you and the other component. Okay, great. And um, this actually, we made the decision to make the, have this go to HHS because of the subject matter. But obviously, when it comes to the issues of creating an office further down the road and legislation, that will have to go through GO. And I appreciate Ms. Willen's uh, input on the fact that for now it should be referred to as a program because legislation hasn't, you know, come through. Um, and so I think that that we are pretty good with that. Um, in terms of the uh, I'm trying to figure out where we are. Are we now on to two? We're on 1.5, which is the community engagement cluster. Okay, budget. so looking at the yes. at the at the um, at the packet, and I'm trying to figure out where we are. Um, so, in terms of community cluster, community uh, engagement cluster, uh, Ms. McGuire, I think that we uh, unanimously just adopted the executive's recommendation. Um, however, we did have a conversation about um, the capacity needed in the East County uh, Regional Services Center since Mr. J. Ru ha has taken on some additional responsibilities that are not uh, necessarily part of the other uh, regional services centers and wanted to make sure that he's able to execute all of that. Um, so we did agree uh, with a uh, 0.5, I believe, uh, administrative uh, support. I don't remember the actual title, but basically for administrative support um, so that he can uh, execute appropriately all of those additional um, activities, uh, and uh, that was the only outstanding issue, but I'll turn it to you, Ms. McGuire, if there are any other issues that you would like to specifically uh, point to, but um, that was the committee's recommendation, and thank Council Member Katz and Friedson for the discussion. No, thank you, and um, Chair Navarro and, and Chair President Albernos have described uh, both committee's discussions. Um, just clarifying one uh, additional piece, as you mentioned, the um, we will uh, craft also budget language just to, again, continue to confirm sort of the status of this effort. Uh, important that the funding is available to uh, continue the work. Um, and maintain continuity for the uh, forthcoming uh, office currently program of food support uh, system resiliency. Um, but again, we will be clear with budget language to uh, indicate that status pending the legislation. Uh, otherwise, the committee recommendations are as described. And just uh, for the record, it is 8,627,026, 8, I believe, correct? I don't know if that includes the additional um, the inclusion of the administration, administrative support, not sure, but. I'm sorry, Mr. Navarro, you mean for the. Um, for the engagement cluster. Community uh, engagement budget? cluster yeah, yeah. budget amount. Um, 
Okay. So it's 0.5 FTE for a business management team administrative specialist. That yes, and we will uh, we will again reflect that uh, addition on the reconciliation list. Uh, so the the committee's recommendation to concur with the executive's recommended budget level is 8.6 8 million 627 thousand. $26, as you indicated. That is also 47.75 FTE with the uh, addition, as you described, of the halftime position, um, which I believe has been described as a uh, business management team administrative specialist, and we'll reflect that on the, on the reconciliation list. Thank you very much. It is not a huge addition on the reconciliation list, but it will go a long way um, to, to assist, again, in these additional responsibilities that Jeru, Mr. Jeru Bande, who is amazing, is executing, um, and uh, that is just really needed. I think that's it, Mr. President. Great. So we have a joint committee recommendation. All those in favor of the joint committee recommendation, please raise your hands. Oh, Ms. Oh, Wellens. Yeah, yeah, we need some clarification on the on the uh, Food Resiliency Office. Uh, correct. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. President. So just regarding the Office of Food Resiliency, and I appreciate the clarification that is a program and we are expecting legislative proposal by the county executive. There's just the issue of the location of the program funding, um, whether that's in CEX or it's somewhere else. So, um, I mean, as council staff, I would recommend putting it in CEX. The community engagement cluster is a collection of offices, as we know, obviously, that the, the new office, once it's created, could be a part of that. Um, but that, that just seems the cleanest to me in terms of how we formulate the budget. And that's item number eight, the Office of County Executive. So I wonder if we can just We can represent that. that as a shift. Um, and okay. if the full council supports that, I think we can, again, represent that shift as the, in, as the intent of the council at this time. Because at this time, we are deeming this to be an, a program and not an office because the charter does not allow us to do that without legislation. So I think that if, if that's the best way to do it, then we without do that. Objection. Get that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, uh, with that amendment, uh, can I get a motion to accept the joint committee recommendation? So moved. Moved by Councilmember Katz. Second. Seconded by uh, Chair Navarro. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present and virtually present. I didn't hear Councilmember Rice. Yep, didn't hear Councilmember Rice. We still have a quorum, though, so we're, we're good. Okay. Yep, Councilman Twander. All right, um, that is it. Oh, no, no I'm no, sorry, no, there's one no, more. We have, number two. Uh, we do. Darn. Close. There are uh, CIP amendments that we need to review. Okay. okay. Please go ahead. Okay. So uh, the com HHS committee and the Joint Committee reviewed uh, two uh, uh, CIP amendments recommended by the executive, uh, or actually, well, Anyway, reviewed CIP amendments. The first one is the Restoration Center. The council approved through straw vote um, the, this project in April, subsequently re received um, an amendment that increases state aid for the project, doesn't change the total project funding. Um, so the total amount of state aid now is 17 million, which with 12 million programmed in 23 and 5 million programmed in 24. It's about a $7.6 million increase in state aid. Um, and that's really the only change in the PDF. Councilmember Katz. Thank you. And I discussed this yesterday. This has changed spaces uh, uh, from, through the uh, Public Safety as well as HHS Committee. I want to be very clear I'm in favor, very much so in favor of the Restoration Center. I'm very concerned about it being on seven locks. But I just wanted to be very clear on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The second item is the Nebel Street Shelter Phase Two Amendment. It's a new project that programs 500,000 in geo bonds for site work improvements, building envelope evaluation, and preliminary planning for solar facilities at the homeless shelter, which opened in March. Um, work is expected to be started and completed in 23. Because of the urgency in finishing the shelter project in order to move shelter residents from um, recreation center facilities as well as um, the existing shelters expiring lease. Uh, the 
only those items that were required to be done in order to get the men moved uh, took place in the in the uh, earlier project. So this is this allows um, needed work to continue at the site. Okay. Um, then moving on to joint committee recommendations, the executive recommended the child care renovations project um, because again there was the county was successful in getting additional state aid for critical projects, it, it allowed additional capacity for others. And so the executive has recommended a million extra in 23 and a the same amount in 24. So a total of $2 million for this project. Um, the committee recommended uh, the amendments subject to availability of funds at reconciliation. The, the all the amounts that are programmed in this project are based on uh, mag, um, you know, very broad uh, estimates. And finally, the last item is a, a amendment that the joint committee reviewed for the high school wellness center and expanded wellness center project. Um, sorry, expanded wellness services. Um, the joint committee. Uh, is continuing its efforts to expand the high school wellness center and services in response to the proposal by council member Navarro. Um, the recommended amendments include $5 million in 23 to build out space for interim expansion of mental health and positive youth development services. This builds on funding that was appropriated for by special appropriation in 22 so that these interim services can begin in the next school year. The second item is planning and feasibility study pro, um, funding of 3 million in 23 to look at these processes to site high school wellness centers at all high schools. And then there is 18 million programmed in fiscal year 24 to allow for planning and construction of four high school wellness centers. Um, and that's uh, what's being recommended. Thank you, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, I do want to um, express my appreciation uh, to Dr. McKnight and President Wolf, Board of Education for forwarding a request for uh, relocatables. And I uh, just wanted to make sure that I read into the record. I understand, of course, that our CIP is always quite constrained. Uh, my initial conversations, Dr. Kroll will remember this, as we talked about this expansion, was that we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. So if there are opportunities where the relocatables can uh, provide that space, obviously that would be a lot less expensive um, that, you know, trying to build an addition. However, of course, if there are schools that are in the process of uh, having reconstruction done or expansions, et cetera. Great, let's take advantage of that. But I think it is gonna be important to be uh, creative. I remember the duty centers. I mean, that was something that we used relocatables for a very long time and it was successful. Um, but I hope that we don't get to a point where basically we say, well, you know, we can't move forward because it's just too much money to incorporate them uh, into the blueprint, uh, the footprint of an actual um, school. Just wanted to put that into the record um, as legislative history in terms of the intent, if my colleagues uh, are okay with that. Yeah, that, I'm definitely okay with that. And uh, I agree, I, I like the, let's not be perfect, be the enemy of the good. I know that with the best of intentions, each school wants to create a space that is robust and identifies as a complete wellness center. We understand there's a transition phase, whatever, anything is better than nothing right now. Um, and we, we, we do need to, phase this in clearly, but we've got any, as, as articulated so well before by Councilmember Navarro, we have an immediate need right now. So um, just to our mess, that message to our partners in MCPS, um, thank you all and Mr. DeAndrea for your nimbleness and flexibility, but if the principals could understand, we know that there isn't a perfect space available. We just need to get this going. Thank you. Uh, without objection, I assume colleagues? Yes, without objection. Uh, so we've got a, a committee and joint committee recommendation. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present and present virtually. Great. Thank you all very much. And with that, colleagues, we are adjourned until 1.30. Sorry, I forgot.
lives. That's what biohealth means. That's what biohealth does. Continuing to build the county's reputation as a leader in biotechnology by attracting and retaining biohealth companies.